All right, I think we'll begin now. Um, so I'm going to introduce all of our speakers, uh, an honor that I've been presented with now. Um, and I'll read everyone's bios and then head to the wings. And then after everybody's read, uh, I'll come back up and we can have some questions, hopefully, with the extra time. Okay. So starting us off is Patrick Bixby. Patrick Bixby is Associate Professor of English at Arizona State University and the author. If you can, uh, you need your voice in the microphone. Okay. Okay. Patrick Bixby is Associate Professor of English at Arizona State University and the author of Samuel Beckett and the Postcolonial Novel, as well as co-editor -ed with Gregory Castle of Standish O'Grady's Cahoolan, a critical edition and a, major hi and a history of Irish modernism. His essays have appeared in journals including Modernism Modernity, Modernist Cultures, Irish Studies Review, and the Journal of Beckett Studies. In addition to collections such as Beckett in Context, Beckett in Ireland, A History of Modernist Novel, and A History of Irish Modernism. He's currently completing a book on Nietzsche and Irish Modernism and beginning another on Irish travel writing during the Modernist era. He also organized the inaugural conference of the Samuel Beckett Society in 2015. One moment, please. And second, we have Catherine Fay. Catherine's research takes place within the field of word and music studies and concerns the relationship between music, psychoanalysis, and modernism in the work of Samuel Beckett. She's a second year PhD student at the Department of Music at the University of York, and her project is supervised by Dr. Catherine Laws and Dr. Mille Moran. Catherine holds a WROCAH scholarship and an AHRC International Placement Scheme Fellowship at the Harry Ransom Center, University of Texas, Austin. And finally, we have Douglas Atkinson, visiting professor of literature and literary theory at the Vrije University, Brussels, where he lectures in critical thinking and academic composition. Additionally, he gives courses in comparative literature and advanced English proficiency for students in literature and linguistics. He holds a PhD in philosophy and specializes in 20th century continental philosophy with a focus on the intersection between philosophy and literature. His current work is on the philosophic import of Maurice Blanchot and his influence on the philosophy of language. His literary interests focus primarily on Beckett, modernism, postmodernism, and modern Japanese literature. Patrick, will we? Antes que nada, he escrito algo breve en español, pues con la ayuda de José Francisco. Me gustaría agradecer a los organizadores de este congreso, especialmente a la luz, a luz uh, María Sánchez, la oportunidad que me brindan de presentar aquí mi ponencia sobre Beckett. Estoy muy contento de participar en este magnífico evento y espero que mis palabras sean de su interés. Muchas gracias a todo. And now, in my language, mostly, some German too. This is Beckett in the Schreckenskammer. On the 22nd of January, 1937, Samuel Beckett traveled from Berlin to Halle, where he viewed a special exhibition of modern art in the so-called Schreckenskammer, or Chamber of Horrors, at Moritzburg Castle. There he was fascinated by the work of artists, mostly German and mostly expressionist, who had been identified by the German curator and art historian Max Sauerland uh, as important exponents of the European avant-garde. Artists included uh, Haeckel, Klee, Kokoschka, Kirchner, Kandinsky, Munch, uh, Schmidt Rutloff, um, and many others. But Sauerland's commitment to modern art had led him to be removed from his position as director of the Hamburg Museum of Arts and Crafts under the Act of Restoration of Civil Service in 1923, sorry, 1933. Not long after Beckett visited Halle, the Schreckenskammer exhibit would be integrated into the infamous Entarte Kunst, or Degenerate Art, exhibition in Munich which was curated with the aim of demonstrating that modernism in the arts, with all its perceived corruption and depravity, was an affront to the German spirit. His journey next took him to see a private collection of modernist paintings in the home of Felix Weisse in Halle, where Beckett discussed, and this is quoting from the diaries, the widening gulf between the artist, official and public from the 19th century on, dreadful situation, aesthetic in the shadow of expressionism, and material, the young artist, in Germany. The following day, he journeyed to Weimar, where he witnessed a Nazi celebration in the Stadthaus uh, restaurant, 
and visited the famed houses come tourist attractions of the Weimar classicists, Goethe and Schiller. Before making a trip to Erfurt, where he was pleasant, pleasantly surprised to find a number of exceptional modernist paintings still on display. These stops on Beckett's itinerary, as he shuttled from forbidden modernist artworks to celebrated national landmarks to menacing fascist revels, provide the coordinates for my talk today, which will address the remarkable aesthetic education the writer received during his German sojourn of 1936-37. One that pitted modernism with its innovative distortions and abstractions, not just against academism or classicism, but against state censorship, racist propaganda, and fascist authoritarianism. What I want to suggest initially is that Beckett's diaries should be viewed as a type of travel writing, and more specifically, a variety often associated with the so-called grand tour. Increased scholarly attention in the form of monographs, essay collections, museum exhibitions, and scholarly websites to the legacy of the Grand Tour has highlighted the range of writing accompanying the tradition. Novels, memoirs, letters, essays, guidebooks, and most relevant here, travel diaries. These documents recorded the impressions of young travelers as they encountered the sights and sounds of the continent for the first time. Beginning shortly after the Restoration and con continuing on well into the 19th century, the custom of the Grand Tour served as a means to prepare young men for diplomatic service or public officialdom, but soon evolved from more practical and professional pursuits towards broader forms of aesthetic education through exposure to museum collections, architect architectural marvels, great libraries, and classical treasures, in addition to clothing, fashions, luxury goods, and popular entertainments. Through this exposure, grand tourists were expected to complete the education they had begun at the university by developing social graces and professional connections as well as by acquiring a certain polish and sophistication in their cultural knowledge and artistic taste. Without the benefit of these encounters, one was supposed to be doomed to inadequacy or meanness. As Samuel Johnson, one of Beckett's favorite writers, of course, put it, a man who has not been to Italy is always conscious of an inferiority for his not having seen what is expected a man should see. But this mode of travel was also directed to the loftier aims of aesthetic education one thinks immediately of Schiller's reflections on these aspirations in response both to Kant's critique of judgment in the reign of terror, reflections that in emphasizing man's capacity for feeling, as Schiller puts it, allied beauty and freedom, aesthetic experience, and moral development. Although the tradition of the Grand Tour waned with the spread of the railway systems and the rise of the travel industry, uh, its legacy stretched through the 20th century and is still with us today to the extent that the continental sojourn is still valued as a mark of distinction and a source of edification uh, for young people coming from abroad. It's easy enough to view Beckett's German travels through the lens of this legacy. Even before finishing Murphy in June 1936, he had uh, been considering an extended trip to the continent. Spain had been on his mind, but civil war made the destination unfeasible. Amsterdam and Copenhagen uh, offered alluring cultural fare, but they were deemed too expensive. Italy, the principal destination of earlier grand tourists, offered Beckett an intriguing uh, literary and artistic heritage, but he was not enticed enough to journey there. Germany, in contrast, was already familiar, already rather familiar, after Beckett's earlier trips to visit his aunt's family in Kassel, which had exposed him to new movements in German art through, the, uh, through his uncle's endeavors as an art dealer. And beginning the previous year, 1935, the young men had intently read Goethe, especially uh, Dichtung und Wahrheit, uh, which prompted him to take more than 40 pages of notes in the German. Perhaps more importantly, over the previous decade, Beckett had become increasingly interested in the old masters of European oil painting, particularly the 17th century Dutch and Flemish artists whose work he had seen in Dublin, London, and Paris. An extended trip through a number of German cities offered the opportunity to enhance his firsthand knowledge of this tradition with, further, with the further possibility of readying him for a career in art curation or criticism. It was this possibility, however vaguely conceived, that he had in mind when he set off for, from Dublin to Hamburg in late September 1936. But as we've already seen, Beckett's experience as a continental tourist was not what he had anticipated, because it was profoundly impacted by the increasingly so, tense social, political, and artistic environments uh, he encountered as he made his way across Nazi Germany. 
When he arrived, Beckett encountered a state regime that, had already dramatically, that was already dramatically restricting the scope of national culture. Hitler had re recently given orders for the so-called liberation of cultural affairs, which commenced a brutal crackdown on allegedly decadent or degenerate art. And by early November, directives were being issued for curators and gallery directors to remove such art from public display. As Beckett traveled through Germany, he often visited museums and galleries where the modern rooms had been closed to viewing or modern paintings had been taken down from the walls. He also found it difficult to attain certain books on German art while collections of Nazi-approved books filled bookstores and exhibition halls and fascist propaganda celebrating Nazi-approved cultural and artistic activities emanated from the radio. As Tobin Siebers has remarked, Hitler's perverse love of art and his conception of himself as an artist meant that art was the preferred vehicle for the development of Nazi ideas and philosophy, leading to what Benjamin memorably called the aestheticization of politics under the fascist regime. Three years before Beckett's trip, Goebbels had put it, been put in charge of the Reich culture chamber, and by the time of Beckett's arrival, the organization had enrolled more than 100,000 racially pure, or at least compliant, artists who were allowed to continue their cultural activities without state interference. During this period, classical Greek and Roman art, often the focus of attention for earlier grand tourists, quickly became the preferred model of German artistic production because its aesthetic forms were thought to, be, thought to embody a racial ideal. So I've, I've neglected my PowerPoint, but here's some of the images or at least images from the artists that Beckett would have seen in the Schreckenskammer in Mordsburg Castle, which were later collected in Munich in the uh, Antarctic Kunst exhibition. This is a quote that I've already given you. Those are the Schiller houses. But these are examples of the kind of art that was uh, legitimized by the Nazi regime during this period. And the contrast between that and what he had seen in the Wurzburg Castle is rather uh, dramatic, to say the least. So in this and other regards, Nazi aesthetics drew heavily on Max Nordau's anti- I'll let you linger on these images as I continue. Uh, rather heavily on Max Nordau's anti-modernist polemic, Degeneration, which had used a quasi-medico-scientific set of criteria to measure the moral and artistic value of fin de siècle culture, in which, it bears mentioning, Beckett had read and annotated in the early 1930s. Nordau's basic assumption, inspired in part by the so-called healthy genius of Goethe and the Weimar classicists, is that the healthy work of art should demonstrate the workies of, workings of a healthy mind and body, as well as promote human developments that rises to the level of an archetypal humanity. Degenerate art, on the other hand, is demonstrative of a failure, both ethical and evolutionary, of the individual to participate in an abstract form of pure humanity due to what Nordau calls a morbid deviation from an original type. According to this line of thought, Modern art was indicative of racial impurity and the damaging effects, maybe tighten that. Was I too close? <laughs> okay. Um, where am I? And the damaging effects of modern life, which could be seen in its distortions of classical form, its disruption of line and perspective, and its deployment of non-naturalistic or expressionistic colors. In the 1920s, under the Weimar government, Germany had become an important site for avant-garde cultural production as various forms of expressionism in painting, sculpture, and film had flourished. Ernst Bloch, perhaps the movement's most important theorist, had shared Schiller's sense that art and culture might provide a path to the attainment of political freedom. Though rather than echoing his predecessor's faith in the harmony of classical aesthetics, he placed his hope for cultural renewal, renewal in the utopian images of genuine expressionism in the European avant-garde. Unfortunately, his hope was soon crushed by the rise of the Nazi regime. By the mid-1930s, as Beckett witnessed during his journey, modern artists who did not adapt Nazi-approved aesthetics were discharged from teaching positions, banned from exhibiting or selling their work, subjected to interrogation and intimidation, and in a number of cases prohibited from producing art at all.
Given these circumstances, it is perhaps most remark what is perhaps most remarkable about the German diaries is precisely their fascination with might be what might be called degenerate aesthetics. As he traveled across the country, Beckett sought out contact with a number of persecuted artists, art historians, and art collectors, as well as access to collections of German art, modern German art, going so far as to request a letter from the British consulate to see banned books, banned works, sorry. He also sought out prohibited and hard to find books on a number of contemporary artists and took detailed notes on what he saw, discussed, and read. In addition to the, in addition to the Schrecken's Kammer in the Mordsburg Castle, he saw a significant collection of German expressionists in the Hamburg Kunsthalle, a number of modern works in the Kronprinzenpalast in Berlin, and several important private collections of recently banned paintings in other parts of the country. Through these efforts, he was able to see the work of artists that I've already mentioned, Heiko Klee, Kokoschka, and others, as well as Emil Nolde and many other artists who had fallen afoul of the Nazi authorities. Beckett's exposure to the work of these artists bears closer scrutiny but I'll focus on just two of them for further comment here. The sculptor Ernst Barlach and the painter Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. During the course of his trip, Beckett tried repeatedly to purchase a book, a banned book by, on Barlach, who's best known for a series of expressionist sculptures based on his brief experience as a soldier in the First World War. That's what we have here. His pacifist politics, along with his unheroic, unheroic portrayals, of German soldiers generated a great deal of controversy during the Nazi regime, and his work was eventually confiscated in 1936. Kirchner uh, had also been deeply traumatized by his time as a soldier, suffering a psychological breakdown after serving in the army for a short time. A decade earlier, he had founded an artistic collective known as Die Brücke, which set out to challenge traditional academic style and went on to become, a cent become central to the Expressionist movement. Later, uh, Kirchner's work would feature prominently in degenerate art exhibitions curated by the Nazis. Beckett, who managed to see a number of his paintings in the cellar of the Hamburg Kunsthalle, in the Schreckenskammer exhibits, and in several private collections, singled out Kirchner as the most important artist from Die Brücke due to his ability, and this is quoting from the diaries, to give expression to emotional atmospheres or states of mind. Perhaps even more remarkable, however, is Beckett's response to the old masters whose work he saw in museums across Germany. He spent a great, great deal of time contemplating the 16th and 17th century paintings of the Dutch, Flemish, and Italian schools in these museums. But in a letter to Thomas McGreevy, he described his response to many of them in the following terms. Impatience with the immensely competent bullies and browbeaters and highwaymen and naggers, the Rembrandts and Hollises and Titians and Rubenses and Tarkins of art. Instead, he often preferred emo the emotional intensity and even the attendant distortions and disproportions that he found in the work of lesser known painters to the formal excellence of the most celebrated old masters. So I don't have time today, of course, to explore the immense detail of aesthetic observation in the diaries. There's quite a lot to uh, yet to be studied there. But let me conclude by simply stating what I hope is by now obvious. Beckett's German sojourn was an immensely significant period in his aesthetic education, although one very different from the one that he, uh, the one expected in earlier generations. His diaries indicate that his attention was divided almost evenly between the old masters and the degenerate avant-garde. They also describe an oscillation between opposed modes of perception, an opposition that's perhaps best demarcated by Benjamin's work of this same period. On the one hand, the co contemplative state of the gallery stroller or muse museum goer who falls under the aura of the artwork and thus participates in the bourgeois cult of art. On the other hand, the scattered attention of the city walker or pedestrian tourist <clears throat> who encounters the shocks and discontinuities of modern life and thus generates a new form of knowledge for the distracted viewer. Beckett seems to have sought out both kinds of experience, that is traditional aesthetic contemplation with its reactionary associations and modern pedestrian distraction with its more progressive implications in, ne in nearly equal measure. But it is Adorno who is a better guide to the aesthetic education received, Beckett received during his tour through Nazi-era Germany. The theorist's dissatisfaction with the line of think initiated by Kant and Schiller, which invokes beauty as an arbiter between the order of freedom and the order of necessity, 
our active and passive sides, mind and body in the widest sense, culminating in the emergence of an aesthetic state, stems from the fact that this aspiration was all but annihilated during the course of the 20th century. It becomes evident that Beckett's encounter with degenerate art in the 1930s reaffirmed an ethical intuition that had been present in his own aesthetic disposition from the very beginning. By endorsing precisely what the enemies of degenerate art had disavowed, Beckett's diaries offer an alternative to the conceptions of human development and cultural value associated with the Weimar classicists, particularly the evolutionary narrative beginning, with, beginning in savagery and leading to civility. Beckett was still in Munich when he read an advertisement for the Grosse Deutsche Kunstalung of Nazi-approved art in the Haus der Deutschen Kunst, which was scheduled to open one day prior to the uh, Antarctic Kunst exhibition. His response to the announcement, which declared that the period of Nolde and uh, De Brucke and Mark had been überwundung, that is overcome, was typically Beckettian, I suppose. <clears throat> Soon, he wrote in his travel diaries, I shall really begin to puke or go home. And I'll end on that note. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I need my slides up. Somebody put my slides up. Um, so, this paper intends to rejuvenate our understanding of the most visually compelling musical interjections of Beckett's wartime novel. This is the four-part three in which displaces Watt on his venture to the house of Mr. Knott. In doing so, I wish to reflect upon the rhythmic demarcations located within the text and the tonal specifications supplied by the addenda in view of the novel's self-reflexive interrogation of narrative construction. Grappling with these notational flourishes enters us into a discussion of the confounding array of textual changes that comprise Watt's evolution and their relationship to the inarguably obscure conditions in which this maturation process played out. And the three is no exclusion to the ext extensive rewriting process that occurred between the Watt notebooks um, and several years after the war, as well as the dizzying amount of erroneous alterations and subsequent adjustments between the Olympia, Grove, and Calder editions following the novel's already fraught journey to publication. However, the context and development of what is for you to is familiar to many of us, and so I choose not to rehearse the details of the Threen's numerous um, predecessors here, but to specify that the in-text notation and addenda melody under consideration today are those supplied in the 2009 Faber and Faber edition of the novel, edited by Christopher Ackley. And so this is the Threen that most of us are probably quite familiar with. So it's my contention that the music of the Threen should be read in view of the novel's problematization of chronicling what story. Since what is not only a story of the protagonist's lack of adaption to the contingencies of the not abode, but an insight into the problematics of interpretation and reconfiguration involved in condensing the ephemerality of experience into narrative discourse. This is revealed in the novel's warped chronology as well as the indeterminacy of the narrative voice. 
whether a Watts story is given to us by Sam based upon his notebook transcription, or Watts account, uh, sorry, whether Watts story is given to us by Sam based upon his notebook transcription of Watts account or a, or a third editorial persona. The anxiety of record is revealed in the novel's integration of intentional mistakes. Blanks, elisions, ellipsis, and question marks checker the surface of the text. And even the reader is enlisted as editorial support through the inclusion of goading footnotes that request interpretive input. And it's this provisional dimension of the novel that is realized most effectively in the abundance of materials that comprise the indenda, which um, houses the three notation, and which were omitted from previous drafts on account of fatigue and disgust. Okay, so um, the musical encounter in question occurs after Watt ventures into the roadside vegetation following the second leg of his journey to Knott's house. Um, once ensconed in a ditch, voice, uh, quote, voices indifferent in quality of a mixed choir are heard afar from without, end quote. Um, on the opposite page, an insect score is provided along with the lyrics of the first and second verse. And a footnote indicates that the music is a three. And the reader is inquired, encouraged to inquire into the music's all but absent sonic manifestation. Um, despite the in-text score lack of musical characterization, the soprano line is notated in the addenda. So um, I wish to reflect on two features of this episode. The first is Beckett's choice to integrate musical notation into the narrative to reference what's music to reference Watts' musical encounter. And the peculiarity of this graphic illustration arises from its location within a literary frame. While many musical references in modernist literature frequently subordinate reflection on the particularities of the musical material in favor um, of descriptive and metaphorical accounts of its impression, by contrast, the traditional staff notation employed by Beckett indicates an antithetical objective that is a focused and analytical reflection on the structural constituents of a musical work and exposure to the technicalities of the music as composition, thereby indicating the type of structural specificity that the modernist tradition of musical literary description intentionally defers. So why, we might ask, does Beckett choose to provide the music in notated form? Uh, the three's manifestation as notation not only facilitates a view of the music's formal incarnation, but it encourages the direction and filtering of the reader's attention towards specific structural attributes. And importantly, each of these components serve a discrete but important function in determining the dominant way in which we perceive a piece of music. Thus, this rendering allows Beckett to foreground those components that contribute most significantly to the notion of Watt's relationship with the music. Um, the in-text notation should be approached, firstly, I argue, not as a representation of the musical material in question, but as a key to the idios idiosyncrasies of Watt's perception. The most striking feature of the in-text stream is, of course, the absence of pitch specifications. I think I can get a closer view for you. Um, and only simple rhythmic note values are provided, and the lack of music, uh, musical stave, clef, and key signature hinders the ascription of any tonal character to the individual parts, preventing the reader from determining the harmonic relationship between the voices. What are we, make, what are we to make of this peculiar choice? Interestingly, the sparse rhythmic demarcations propose a harmonic format, and the rhythmic characterization of each voice discloses a sense of its potential tonal attributes, despite the lack of pitch specifications. And the next to last entry in the, of the addenda bears a handwritten melody along with the explanation, three heard by Watt on way from station, the soprano sang. Um, I'm going to return to a more detailed analysis of the addenda notation shortly, but for the present time, it's worth specifying that the pitch specifications comprise a six note descending motif repeated 11 times with this culminating rising gesture. Um, so the music bears the key signature of B minor, however, both the F sharp and the C sharp, as well as the placement of the treble clef, are slightly skewed on each of the handwritten staves. Subsequently, a uh, reorientation in our understanding of what the in-text note score represents is warranted, um, given that the in-text notation does not provide enough information to convey the music that Watt supposedly heard. So I propose that we approach the in-text notation as a representation of Watt's reaction to the structural attributes of the dendum and melody. And bearing in mind the novel's kind of reconstructive pro um, project, a key to the desired processes of this perceptual response inferred by the structural constituents that Beckett foregrounds. Reflecting on the philosophical perspectives on music's expressiveness, Stephen Davis, following Leodadis, um, proposes that the profile of an emotion can be represented in music's unfolding structure. 
Um, quote, if music resembles an emotion, it does so by sharing the dynamic character displayed either in the emotion's ph phenomenological profile <clears throat> or in the public behaviors through which the emotion is standardly exhibited. What facilitates the musical representation of an emotion is music's morphological character, granted by its status as a temporal art. Um, in the case of music, Davis explains, this appearance depends on its dynamic topography as it unfolds through time. However, we can be more specific about pinpointing the musical components that ensure that music remains dynamic and thereby identify those features that participate in this sketching out of an emotion's felt dimension. If the representation of an emotion is dependent upon music's dynamic structure, this warrants reflection on the presentation mode afforded by music's temporal status, the horizontal axis, and the musical components that animate it. As Thomas Stainsby and Ian Cross have observed, musical pitch is not experienced as discrete tones, but in groups and patterns. Atenave and Olsen have described pitch as a morphoric and pattern-bearing medium, medium, and this is especially so in its hor horizontal manifestation, whereby alterations in pitch contribute to the formation of musical contours that build melodic motifs. As such, the horizontal dispersal of pitch is fundamental in plotting out the profile of the physical and phenomenological characteristics that we might associate with specific emotional states, if we bear in mind that the physiological and motoric components usually involve embodied contours. The agitation of pitch in time facilitates the fluctuation of musical contour and is therefore closely allied to mu music's capacity to represent the embodied quality of specific emotional states. So by foregrounding the absence of pitch, Beckett implicitly, su implicitly suggests that what not only rejects any emotional content that the three music might be thought to possess, but rebuts the communication of an embodied emotional characteristic. Okay, so with its scalic descent, the soprano line's pitch specification are most obviously indicative of the type of pitch contour that is associated in the Western classical music tradition, and this is the one with which Beckett was um, familiar, with a me melancholic state due to the mimetic relationship that it bears to the physical qualities of sadness. And this is bore out in the many historical representations of slouched or semi-supine figures, as well as phenomenologically orientated patient accounts that attest to feelings of sinking or falling such as are such are recorded in um, the likes of Julia Kristeva's Black Sun. So what we encounter then is the insistent repetition of an accepted rhetorical device for the signification of depressed feeling, an established musical custom from within this Western classical music tradition with which Beckett was familiar. However, what differentiates the three's use from its device? Sorry, what? differentiates the three's use of this device from its employment in the canonical masses. Bach's B minor masses brought into loose association, as, has, has Lee, blah, as Heath Lease suggests, through the botched B minor key signature and ascending final statement, Whoop. Um, is its maddeningly assist, insistent repetition to the exclusion of any melodic development or digression. The blatancy of the melancholic to topoi and its incessant reassertion is perhaps key to reading notation in view of the novel's self-conscious chronicling, chronicling of what story. The descending contour of the soprano part provided in the addenda is one of the most obvious devices for the indication of melancholy feeling within the Western tradition because of its commonplace prevalence and recognizability of the physical experience of the corresponding affect that it represents through this type of gestural condensation. Coupled with this incessant, repeti incessant repetition, the brazen motif reveals not necessarily the speci specificity of what's response, but indicates a type of agency attempting to govern how the music be will be engaged with. It appears that the musical conditions are being manipulated as such that the opportunity of recognizing the embodied state communicated by the music is maximized. We might explore this idea further through the theory of musical affordance. Oh, I've gone the wrong way, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, the notion of affordances was first outlined by James Gibson in 1975. Um, and as Mark Raybrook explains, Gibson's theory refers to, quote, environmental supports for an organism's intentional activities, end quote. Um, these are features exhibited by objects and environments that permit a subject to engage with them and perform an action. In Eric Clark's 2005 Ways of Listening, musical structure is thought, as an object, is thought of as an object in the environment with which our auditory system resonates. Um, quote, in the specific context of musical hermeneutics, 
Musical material can be conceived as affording certain kinds of interpretation and not others. Interpretation is also action, the speaking, writing, gesturing, and grimacing in which interpretation is manifest. The recapitulation of the first movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony affords writing or speaking about it in terms of murderous sexual rage or the heavens on fire, end quote. So if, as Stephen Davis has argued, music can represent emotion through its dynamic component, then music can afford emotional interpretation and potentially action, provided that a representation of the qualities of that emotion are made available through the music for the subject to recognize and resonate with. In this view, music can encourage responses from those who choose to engage with it. However, the specificity of those responses are not necessarily predeterminable, as the outcome of the affordance is dependent upon both subject and object. However, the affordance potential of a musical construct can be exploited so that the likelihood of a specific response is increased. Um, to do so, the object of affordance must, of course, foreground those characteristics that offer the greatest potential for that specific form of engagement to elapse. If the predisposition of the subject engaging with the object affects the type of affordance that unfolds, then the object that wishes to generate a specific response must cater to the underlying commonalities in experience and perception, thereby under eliding the representation of idiosyncras idiosyncrasies that might guarantee an affordance to one individual but alienate another. And it's precisely this sort of agency and determination that is foregrounded by the repetition of the addenda notation which hones in on one of the most emphatic musical gestures within the lament tradition by condensing a commonplace physical quality of melancholic affect in, intent, in an attempt to increase the likelihood of its affordance. As such, the notation invites us to reflect not solely on what it represents, but what it reveals of the music's determination, a type of mimetic response to the physical profile of the emotion communicated, that is, to be moved by and in type of mimetic relation with the music. Now, the identity of the novel's narrative voice is deliberately confusing for the reader, and part one of the novel in which the Thrine occurs challenges the idea that the entirety of Watt is given to, but given to us by Sam, whom Watt befriends in the asylum-like space. While it is more readily accepted that the provisional quality of the later parts of the novel reveals Sam as Watt's mouthpiece, embroiled in the challenging task of deciphering and relaying his story, um, Enoch Breiter has maintained that part one of the novel sits apart from Watt and Sam's efforts and does not constitute part of Watt's hampered account and Sam's laboured transcription process. However, um, a sort of more musicologically orientated reading of the three notation indicates that the same slippage we associate with those parts of the novel assigned to Sam or a third editorial persona's reconstructive process begins to occur earlier in the text than perhaps previously acknowledged. The question of the persons between whom this occurs remains unclear, and it's perhaps all the more interesting on account of the fact that the notation exposes the same challenges encountered by Watt and Sam, despite the fact that neither have been assigned a role in informing part one of the novel or the addenda. As Sam discloses to the reader, Watt's account has been hampered by his peculiar and deteriorating patterns of speech, making it differently dif difficult to decipher his meaning, and it gradually becomes apparent that Sam's faculties have also been deteriorating, thereby hindering their already limited channel of communication. And to add to this, we have the idea that Sam recorded Watt's story in a notebook, which may have given rise to erroneous inclusions and omissions. Um, hang on to Okay, so um, my next observation, and so my next observation combines a view of the addenda notation as an indication of the music's agency and consideration of the motif's incessant repetition and tentic rhythmic and intervallic changes. While Susan Seneff has argued that the incremental variations are indicative of what's stupor, I suggest that we view these tiny discrepancies as a byproduct of the notational practice. They give the impression that the motif is being sketched repeatedly um, in order to concretize the most accurate hearing, and that at each rearticulation, the price, precise rhythmic distribution and, and pitch content slips. Oh, I've gone the wrong way, sorry. Okay. Um, the descending motif is repeated 11 times, but on only three of its reiterations um, are the third and the sixth degrees of the scale, which, are, which lend its minor tonality. I'll start that again, because I got that muddled. The descending motif is repeated 11 times, but only three of its reiterations comprise the third and sixth degrees of the scale that lend its minor tonality, so that the pitch content is demonstratively melancholic in neat correspondence with this indic indicative descending contour. Likewise, the culminating statement rising towards an end note, um, rises towards an end note that is a semitone lower than the anticipated B. So the notion that the motif is being repeated in order to retrieve um, the correct hearing from memory is revealed by the rhythmic elongation 
rhythmic elongation of the fourth and second degrees, which border this indicatively minor third. Um, and this sort of provides the impression that the fourth and second neighbor tones are sustained by the hesitant reciter as they search through auditory memory for the precise melancholic pitch content. Consequently, the descending contour of the motif, expressive and embodied melancholic characteristic, is consistent re consistently re-employed, even though the corresponding affective content lent by the requisite minor tones are not invariably encompass encompassed in the scalic descent. However, each haphazard reiteration, um, after each haphazard iteration, the reciter consistently returns to the same device and to the contour. So the addenda notation suggests that the musical representation of the embodied emotional contour is harnessed in the re-articulation of the musical experience to encourage a movement towards the correct iteration of the effective content. The descending musical contour, is which is representative of this embodied melancholic char char characteristic, is used almost as a type of um, frame or memory aid within which the effective content can materialize and be retrieved. In this sense, the theme reduplicates um, Watt's predicament upon his encounter with the departing servant Mick, Mix, um, when Watt assumes a posture that imitates the three in contour in, in anticipation of performing the servant speech in the manner of arson, only to find that the content of his few simple words of parting escapes him. Okay, so I wish to suggest that the addenda pitch specifications bear witness to the problems of delivering and preserving accounts of long past ephemeral experience. The tonal specifications supplied in the addenda are not, as the in-text score would have us believe, a fully-fledged soprano, um, fully-fledged melody ascribed to the soprano, but an abstracted musical moment from a much broader musical experience that has bizarre abided and persisted in the memory, much like an earworm. As such, the six-note cell or motif associated with the soprano voice is in fact a residue, a kind of residual um, notation of all of the voices. And this is given away by the two dots accompanying the treble clap um, that are actually a feature of the bass clef. Um, no two dots ever follow a treble clef, so he's trying to evoke a treble clef and a bass clef simultaneously. Ooh. <laughs> Um, if the addenda notation reveals the determination of the music as affordance and the determination of affordance as a mimetic response to the embodied components of the affective state represented by the music structure, um, then this fragment may be approached as a highly decisive selection of a fragment of musical material based on its associ with, association with this experience of being moved by the music. The preservation of the select fragment suggests that the addenda notation is in some way being employed, employed to afford the same moving experience to a prospective narrator or scribe which will recount the story and afford the same experiences to others as in the manner of Watt and Sam's exchanges. Um, the notation that has been hastily sketched is, as I've said many times now, I'm realizing that I'm a bit repetitive, uh, is a musical melancholic topos indicating that the addenda offering is a type of overview of the musical content, a broad overarching capture of the most potent material that has been easiest to retain because of its prominence. The elision of other details, whether the lower voice parts or other features of the soprano melody, is not only due to agency or determination governing the presentation of the musical material, but perhaps the processes of prior prioritization dictated by the corrosive effects of memory and retention, since it is the most compelling fragment that's retained. And more specifically, the other voices are ancillary or secondary elements that perhaps have been overlooked in the project of retaining what is essential. That is the best, the best, the part that can best afford the encouraged mimetic response. The three then is a sedimentation of a desperate attempt to capture the residue that remains of an effective experience eroded by memory and the haphazard processes of the testing and recording in a specific format that will hope or gu gu hopefully guarantee the perpetuation of that experience. Um, upon consultation of the absurd Um, upon consultation of the absurd lyrics the three, um, of the three, the reader is confronted with the full limitations of this endeavor and the erosive effect of memory on affective recall, as well as the danger of honing in on the potent affordances to the exclusion of nuanced details and layers of experience. Although the lyrics of the three are superficially in keeping with the proposed content of a musical memorial, it is utterly devoid of emotional sentiment and colour. And similarly, there is nothing moving or saddening about the repeated motif and ascending final statement, hopelessly reiterated, precisely because it is lifted from a broader musical context and divorced from the other layers of exper 
expression provided by the other vocal parts or other features of the soprano line that excluded from the anxious pracy. It's in its attempt to fasten upon the specificity of an affective experience, the, th the threen turns itself into parody and caricature. So if the threen is counted amongst the novel's many calls to the reader to engage in the project of solidifying the sort of minutiae of what's experienced, then the in-text score can be viewed as a type of skeletal frame or apparatus drawn up so as to encourage the reader to experiment with the reattribution of tones to other voice parts, thereby filling in the forgotten fragments with affective color, as in the practice of harmonization. Um, all of the musicologists that I've spoken to that have come across this novel have all tried to, have all attempted to harmonize the threen at some point. <laughs> So thus the three suggests that it is not only the reconstruction of what story that the novel attempts, but a resurrection of the effective qualities of one's at what's at Dever at the Not Abode in combination with the narrative. However, a joint consultation of both the in-text score and the addendum notation demonstrates that the blank rhythmic demarcations that welcome the reader's input are predicated on a view of the addenda speech of speech pitch specifications as a soprano melody. If we maintain a view of the addenda notation as a practice of sketching out the correct hearing of an earworm that is preserved on account of its potential to afford what's experienced of the broader musical encounter rather than the actual music that what encountered, then the in-text notation is an inherently fault-ridden construct compiled after the discovery of the addenda um, pitch specifications and a misinterpretation of them as melody. Thus configured, the in-text frame casts problematic suggestions as to the way in which the parts should be dialed in relation to one, one another. Any musical harmonization based on a view of the preserved motif as a soprano melody would fail to take into full account the idios idiosyncrasies of each part, since the material provided for their development is only a frugal capture of a much broader musical experience. I'm nearly finished. So, the threen participates in what's parody of the relation between part and whole, since in fact the distinction between part and whole, fragment and narrative, are confounded and obscured by the abrupt threnody. The, the addenda notation is a fragment of a greater musical experience that condenses the essence of that experience. This indicative fragment is then protracted to constitute a melody, and in doing so suggests a mu that musical experience. This dubia, dubious proposal is meagre compared to its original, since the abiding earworm has become the lens through which the reader is encouraged to venture towards determining the other voices and the ancillary part. This reading of the three potentially has broader implications for the novel, since it suggests that what slips in the channel of communication is not only um, accuracy, um, but nuanced and effective resonance of personal account. Um, and to approach any of the scenes in what uh, as only philosophical and humorous parody, perhaps misses the articulation of a much more painful melancholic search that lies at the heart of what's experienced, along with the good will but fateful intentions of whoever is involved in solidifying this. Thus, the novel is frustrating not only because of the hermeneutic project that it establishes with the reader in tandem with what, but the sheer distance at which it sits from the real affective experience from the searching melancholic mind that it tries to express. Thank you. Is this okay like this? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Uh, hello. Okay, so this is my paper entitled With a Wound That Doesn't Bleed, The Missed Encounter Between Beckett and the Poet Bira Rutia. Quote, execrable for the most part, end quote. Beckett's letters would seem to make clear his dissatisfaction with the project of the anthology of Mexican poetry that he translated in 1950. That being said, I think it is still fair to say that many readers in the English-speaking Beckett world know very little about this project, which was funded and, more importantly, had its content controlled and indeed dictated to Octavio Paz by UNESCO. Even more importantly, however, and despite the excellent work done by scholars such as Marie-José Carrera, 
Jose Francisco Fernando Sanchez, and of course, John Pilling, I believe it is also fair that most readers of Beckett in general do not know the complex story behind this anthology. Fortunately, Patricia Nobilas Cobalan's recent monograph, Modernism and Latin America, Transnational Networks of Literary Exchange, does an outstanding job of broadening the previous research by focusing much needed attention on Passe's side of the story. For while readers of Beckett's letters no doubt are familiar with the disparaging terms he used to describe the project as a whole, Passe's own satisfaction, if not disgust, with the project is much less well known. Like Beckett, Pass was also in need of financial support at this time, and thus agreed to take on a project whose basic premise was essentially offensive to him, a nationalized anthology. Beyond this, and more pertinent to my paper here today, Pass, was also, Pass also disagreed with UNESCO's decision to limit the work to canonize authors from the past four centuries as this would rule out many voices from contemporary Mexican poetry, which Paz thought contained some of the best in the Spanish-speaking world. Of all the voices lost through this decision, there is one that I would like to focus on today, namely the poetry of Javier Bierarrutia. Not only was Bierarrutia a leading figure in the Mexican modernist movement, and not only had he played a major role in Paz's own poetry and career, his omission from the anthology also led to a missed encounter with Samuel Beckett, which I will argue is particularly significant due to the thematic and philosophic similarities that Bierrutia shared with Beckett. It's not just that I think Beckett would have liked Bierrutia. Much more importantly, is this going to change? Okay. Much more importantly, I would like to argue that had he had the privilege of reading Bierarutia's poetry, Beckett would have been forced to consider, and perhaps even reconsider, the significance of one of his favorite topics, namely death. Now, H. Porter Abbott has argued that, quote, Beckett's great poem of death is a piece of monologue, end quote. And rather than debate the accuracy of this statement, I will accept Abbott's claim, as I am generally inclined to do, and use a piece of monologue as my point of departure for comparing Beckett's representation of death with a poem taken from Bierrutia's masterpiece, the collection entitled Nostalgia for Death. What I would like to draw your attention to is the incredible amount of similarities between the two writers, despite the fact that they come to entirely different conclusions on the matter of death. I will begin with a brief overview of the conditions surrounding the missed encounter, then move on to Abbott's interpretation before concluding with my own suggestive reading of the significance of death in a piece of monologue, which I will support through a reading of the representation of death in Bierrutia's poem, Nocturne, The Bedroom. My primary point of contestation will be on the central motif of a piece of monologue, moving away from Abbott's focus on mourning and the repetition of the keyword gone my reading will instead focus on a different refrain, namely the I almost said loved ones that resonates throughout the monologue and, I will suggest, directs the movement of, quote, Beckett's great poem of death, end quote, away from an obsession with mourning and instead draws attention, as Bierrutia does in his poetry, to the role of death in the creation of intimacy. Rather than mourning the loss of a particular object or person, I will show that a piece of monologue read through the lens of Bierrutia's poetry can be seen as mourning the loss of relation in general, that is, intimacy or the possibility thereof, and that this is a theme which Beckett would have been exposed to and thus arguably would have had greater fluency with had their missed encounter really incurred. The question I would like to pose to you today is this. If Beckett had read Bierrutia, would it still be the case that, quote, birth was the death of him, end quote. As Nobile Corbalan clarifies, Octavio Paz had several problems with the project. For instance, he found the parameters far too narrow, preferring instead a pan-Latin American anthology. Furthermore, UNESCO's stated goal of publishing, quote, the masterpieces of world literature, end quote, was, to Paz's mind, politically naive and unnecessarily restrictive. 
Such overemphasis on established authors would only, as Pascal Casanova also argued, privilege the status quo, that is, the writers and the traditions that were already well known and thus politically dominant. The avant-garde or the cutting edge of poetry, Pass felt, would never receive the attention it deserved. This was most notably the case in Mexico, where two notable omissions, Birrutia and Gorostiza, were, quote, ruthlessly erased from the anthology, as a furious Paz later recalled, end quote. However, despite the plethora of problems, contrary to what Beckett's letters might suggest, Beckett was actually not one of them. In fact, Paz was actually quite happy with Beckett's translations, and although John Pilling has suggested that there was occasionally tension between the two of them, Pass alludes in his, in his letters to pleasant afternoons spent in conversation with Beckett, where the two would discuss technical intricacies of translation that were bothering Beckett at the time. Pass recalls, perhaps not surprisingly, Beckett's admiration for a few select and particularly dark poems from the 17th century, each of which dealt specifically with death. Equally unsurprising is the apparent discrepancy between Beckett's stated opinion of the project and the actual, I would argue, pleasure he clearly derived from the translations themselves. As Sinead Mooney has point, points out in her Tongue Not Mine, Beckett was regularly self-deprecating when it came to his writing in general, and was even more so when it came to his translations. That he was drawn to the poems on death, of course, is only natural. As Shane Weller has said, Beckett's work as a whole might be described as one long momento mori, or reflection on death. And while Jose Francisco Fernando Sanchez has shown that, quote, there are conflicting scholarly opinions, end quote, regarding Beckett's Spanish, Maria Jose Carrera's extremely thorough research clearly shows that Beckett worked very hard on the translations, again undermining the actual content of several of the letters. Paz himself recalls that, yes, for the most part, Beckett was not happy with the majority of the poems, but he also, quote, showed a deep appreciation for several individual poems, end quote. Thus, it is clear that while Beckett's relationship with the project as a whole was undeniably negative, his sensitivity to the poems and the representations of death that he found in them, in several of them, clearly struck a chord with Beckett at the time. With this in mind, one can clearly understand Pass's frustration and disappointment with the exclusion of Biarruti's work from the project as he was not only one of the most influential figures of his generation, the centrality of death, and in particular, his apophatic, yet uniquely erotic reading of death, would obviously have been of interest to Beckett, and thus would have, at the very least, greatly expanded the latter's appreciation for Mexican poetry. Of course, death is a funny thing in Beckett's work. As Porter Abbott rightly points out, there is a notable change or development in Beckett's writing regarding the representation of death. As he writes, quote, a piece of monologue culminates a long artistic engagement with death, which began with Beckett's first published short story, Assumption, in 1929. And before 1950, death in Beckett is generally a matter of dying, by assumption, by accident, by medical malpractice, by being boiled alive, by explosion, by drowning, by suicide, by murder, by decrepitude. After 1950, however, death is increasingly a matter of mourning. End quote. Thus, whereas the early images of death focus on the destruction of the corporeal body, the latter representations become profoundly more philosophic, clearly demonstrating Beckett's increased admiration for the via negativa, or the apophatic tradition in theology and philosophy. In fact, this is another point of agreement with Biologia, and an essential element of my argument in that this agreement would have allowed Beckett to consider a different reading of the same tradition, that is, it would not have been a view of death that was entirely foreign to him. Like Beckett, death in Biarrutia is not a phenomenon that can be named and defined directly. It is a force that escapes my definition and understanding of it, leading one to speak of it in its absence or by focusing on its lack of substance. We could think of Beckett's oft-repeated quotation from Democritus that nothing is more real than nothing. Now, as Edward Howells clarifies, Traditionally, the central traits at work in the apophatic tradition are one, quote, it is the unsaying or apophasis of language for God, or a mode of discourse using a dialectical structure of affirmation and negation, and two, it is a way of dereliction and suffering, usually understood as pattern on the cross of Christ, end quote. Of course, the importance of the apophatic tradition for Beckett is a well-established fact in the secondary literature. 
And it's clearly the emphasis on dereliction, suffering and loss that is the basis for Porter Abbott's reading of a piece of monologue as the ultimate declaration of Beckett's emphasis on mourning and as such, quote, his great poem on death, end quote. The original working title of the piece, Gone, only further emphasizes the importance of this theme and Porter Abbott's reading. In general, I would certainly say this is an accurate reading and one with which I agree. But I would like to suggest that it is not the only way to read this work, and that a consistent, apophatic reading could focus on a very different relation with the dereliction and suffering, that is, the presence of death, at work in a piece of monologue. Furthermore, it is just such a reading that follows when we consider the monologue from the vantage of Bielutia's apophantic, apophatic eroticism. Firstly, however, let us consider the argument for the emphasis on mourning. Abbott's main textual emphasis is on the word gone, that is repeated and thus to, ascent, to an extent haunts the text. And this is only consistent given his premise that we're dealing with an apophatic discourse on mourning, that the pain of loss brought about through death and dying is what creates a solitary environment of perpetual departure and isolation that encapsulates and defines the individual, in the individual's relation to others and the world. Ergo, quote, birth was the death of him, end quote. But here is also the problem. First off, gone is not the only line that repeats itself and insists, therefore, through repetition. There is also the, quote, I almost said loved ones, which, at least in the film production of the piece, clearly possesses much greater semantic and emotional fluidity and resonance in regard to its evocation. Porter Abbott's key word, gone by comparison, is almost one-dimensional. The real issue I have here is the presupposition of an object that has gone, that has been lost. Mourning is, of course, classically associated with the loss, overinvestment, and eventual reinvestment of libidinal energy in a new object. In contrast, of course, to melancholy, where this process is not achieved and one identifies with a lost object, leading to a vicious circle of self-destruction. Of course, this is seemingly what is at play in a piece of monologue. The absent pictures on the wall, quote, father, mother, alone, he, all three together, end quote, clearly represent the people that have been lost. But if this is really all that is at play here, why the reticence with actually saying loved ones? This refrain certainly waxes and wanes in its emotional content. But in the avoidance in using the words, quote, loved ones, it's almost hypnotic in its elusiveness. There is the obvious possibility that the speaker is avoiding these words, which of course he apophatically unsays rather than ever naming them outright because of the pain that he would suffer from emitting the love and loss that he feels for the photographed individuals. Psychologically speaking, the work of mourning, however, uh, if this piece is really about mourning, is aided by repetition. Naming the loved ones, saying loved ones apophantically, that is declaratively, instead of unsaying it apophatically, would actually alleviate his suffering. His reticence and resistance to enact the work of mourning in language, quote, words are fewing, dying too, end quote, would even suggest a melancholic reading of the play in place of the mourning that Porter Abbott made seem so plausible just a few moments ago. Summarizing the notion of mourning in the language of psychoanalysis, however, Leplanche and Pontali conclude that in its essence, mourning is, quote, the killing of death. It is an act of vengeance toward death for destroying the object or person in question. But what object is actually at play in a piece of monologue? Yes, Abbott's reading is plausible, given the absent photos of, I almost said, loved ones. But what I would argue to be equally plausible is the notion that the reason he hesitates to say loved ones is because now, at the end of his life, the speaker of the monologue has accepted the fact that he had never, in fact, had any loved ones, that he had never actually broken beyond the prison of self-absorption, which an act which is necessary to reach out toward and expose oneself to another person. What is gone is not the people that he had loved, but rather the belief that he had ever managed to love at all. 
What is gone is the belief in the possibility of intimacy between two people. Here, mourning amounts to the killing of death for having taken away not individual others, but alterity in general, leaving him as alone as he now realized he had always been. Thus, birth was the death of him in that it ended the possibility of intimacy. Now, Biaruti's relation to death is just the opposite. Despite, as mentioned, the fact that he clearly writes from a similar tradition, the apophatic. Death in Biarutia is in fact the condition for the possibility of intimacy. Instead of being its denial, death is a space that allows two bodies, or even two voices, to move toward one another, and at least potentially, and albeit momentarily, approach one another through an erotic textuality of absence, where nothing, again, the most real, becomes analogous to a something that touches me without leaving a trace. This is not the naive romanticism of Aristophanes and the regaining of a missing half or missing object. This is a dangerous and desperate exposure to the other that defies definitive catharsis and yet creates a space where the other can potentially appear. Death becomes the space of the possibility of intimacy, or as Levinas says, the caress. Of course, the obvious parallels in terms of setting between Biarruti's poem, The Bedroom, and a piece of monologue are intentional on my part. But by doing so, we can foreground the mood that dominates both texts, namely the absent object in Beckett's bedroom with the relation with absence in Biarruti's. At long last, uh, here, for those of you that do not know it, is Biarruti's poem. Death always takes the shape of our bedroom. It is concave and dark, silent and warm. It gathers in the curtains where the shadows take shelter. It is hard in the mirror and icy and tense, deep in the pillows, white in the sheets. We both know that death takes the shape of our bedroom and that in our bedroom, there's a cold space that erects a wall, a crystal, a silence between us. Then only I know that death is the hollow you leave in our bed when suddenly, for no reason, you sit up or you stand. And it is the crackling of burning leaves your bare feet make across the rug. And it is the sweat that wets our thighs that lock and struggle and then surrender. And it is the sentence you interrupt and let drop. And my question you don't hear, you don't understand, you don't answer. And the silence that falls and entombs you as I watch over your sleep and wonder. And I, only I know that death is the choked words the strange groans and the obscure involuntary movements you make when you wrestle the angel of sleep in your sleep. Death is all this and more that encircles us and brings us together, pulls us apart, and finally leaves us confused, startled, hanging with a wound that doesn't bleed. Then, only then, both of us alone know that it is not love, but darkening death that makes us look face and face in each other's eyes and reach and come together, more than alone and stranded, still more, and each time more, even still. That's the end of the poem. As I hope is now clear, Birutia's apophatic eroticism centralizes death as a non-definable space of pure relation, which stands in stark contrast to the objectified space of mourning that dominates Beckett's piece of monologue. Here, the emphasis in Birutia is not on loss or what is now gone. Rather, the focus becomes creating the possibility of reaching, caressing, or even naming loved ones. The entirety of the bedroom becomes the embodiment of death. It literally, quote, takes shape, end quote, in order to allow the lovers to have a space outside of normal space 
in which they can find and, of course, lose one another. The beautiful, albeit macabre, imagery of the burning leaves the lover's feet makes while walking across the, the, the carpet away from the bed, the interrupted sentence, the unanswered question. All of these images undermine the possibility of a romantic, nostalgic reunification. But in doing so, Birutia also dismisses the possibility of mourning being the modality of death. If there is no object to be lost, how could our relation with death be defined by mourning? Death becomes a modality of its own, a being towards an essentially absent other that does not objectify this relationship, but instead allows for, even accentuates, the possibility of ever finally arriving. This is why, quote, both of us alone know that it is not love but darkening death, end quote, that embodies the bedroom, using the play of absences within to weave a space of potential intimacy. Essentially, this leads to an inversion of Beckett's point of departure. Birth was the death of him. It is only possible if we presuppose the focal point of an object. If the focal point is instead a form of engagement, a means of relating, then I think it would be further more accurate to say that death is the birth of meaning, the other, and even still, the potential for intimacy and encounter. Thus, in conclusion, I think it is clear that Octavio Paz's frustration with UNESCO's unilateral decision to limit the contents of the anthology to canonical writers was not only justified, but even more so, this decision led to the missed encounter between two master writers of the apophatic tradition and two voices that drew their inspiration from an ongoing, even obsessive reflection on the centrality and significance of death in our lives. Had Beckett been required to read and translate Biarrutia's poetry, I have no doubt that the contrasting imagery and meaning of death in the latter's work would have provided a uniquely fertile ground for reflection on Beckett's own interpretation of death. Thank you very much. We have, we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions, if anyone would like to start. Hi, um, my question's for Doug. Um, predictably, I just want to bring up sexuality. <laughs> um, because Villa Ruscio obviously is the only out Mexican poet at the time, I believe. Um, and I think uh, Peter Boxall's es uh, essay chapter on Beckett and homosexuality might draw together the two ideas that you have of, um, of the relationship between um, like personhood and death in um, the two poets. So um, instead of this sort of removal of alterity as being a turning in, um, perhaps it might be more of a kind of self-extension or sameness, similar to that that Boxall describes in, um, in his chapter, um, as sort of like a marker of queerness rather than um, this kind of idea of difference as intimacy, instead this kind of sameness. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering if you could say anything about that in particular. Don? Okay. Yep. Um, yes, for those of you that don't have the, the pleasure of knowing him, Biarrutia was openly homosexual in the early part of the 20th century in Mexico. Quite a task, I imagine. Um, but uh, I explicitly, you know, despite being a big fan of Boxwell's work, I explicitly wanted to not emphasize the homosexuality of this. I don't think that uh, for the content of the poetry, it's necessarily relevant. I think doing so for your work, for example, would be an, an excellent project, and I think it's totally plausible to do so. I wanted to focus more on relationship with poetry and alterity. So I would, didn't want to, I think to, to the, the potential threat I was aware of, and I felt conscious of, was over-sexualizing this on, on, on a homoerotic level. And I think that the intimacy and, and the, the, the approach, uh, the use of death as an approach to alterity is more sexual in general, in general that it's not actually dependent on, uh, on a homoerotic element. Um, I think that do, looking at, at the level would certainly uh, be a very, very relevant uh, uh, area of research. Um, but the relationship with homoeroticism and death, I think, is something that I didn't want to, was, you know, 
uh, a problem I didn't want to, to, bring it, to bring it into the paper. I think it's definitely in, in need of further uh, research, um, but it's something that I, I was, I didn't want to, to highlight that too intensely. I wanted to focus more on the conceptuality of death and Porter Abbott's uh, focusing on mourning of death. Any more questions? Um, I have a question for Catherine regarding, um, well, thank you first for your analysis of what I thought was so interesting to get a kind of musical, musical perspective on those, those sections. It's yeah. brilliant to hear all that detail. Um, I just wondered whether your work or uh, others that you have, uh, have read mm -hmm. have, have looked at any, um, any sections of watch that aren't explicitly in musical notation. So, um, and you know how, m I'm thinking perhaps of the section about the family members that repeats for pages yeah. and pages and, yeah. and also the feeding of the dog, uh -huh. uh, which I guess are, are traditionally read in quite a, a comic way. And of course they yes, are comic, yeah. but perhaps also suggest affect that maybe uh -huh. has a musical element. Yeah, um, the other parts of the novel that I like to think about in consideration um, in relation to the three is um, Arsene's monologue because I think about, I don't know whether any of you, any others here think about it in this way, but I always think about the three as a kind of precursor to the monologue because the three is um, a message that comes from outside um, and what experiences it kind of like a message from another and I think about Arsene's monologue along the same terms um, and um, affect is brought into relation in, in, in Narsen's monologue. You have, um, I'm sure he says a few times about how sad he's feeling, although it doesn't particularly read as being sad, and it references, this is not my area, so I'm sorry if I'm getting it wrong, but I think it references um, literature from the Irish lament tradition. I don't, um, <laughs> sorry? There are some references there to um, Irish literature that's particularly like of a melancholic tone, um, I think. And um, yes, um, I, I, do, I do consider the two in relation to one another, but it's also um, interesting the way in which his, his speech is kind of um, punctuated by those um, ha like howls, howls the, the kind of like laughter exclamations. Um, and I think generally, um, when we think about, because I've, I've been talking about melancholia, when we think about melancholia, we always think about it in terms of sadness, but if you think about the Freudian idea of melancholia that I think Beckett was quite familiar with, um, he also talks about um, the melancholic's eye for, um, I, don't know, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but the eye for, it's like, no, it's to do with um, it's to do with kind of um, an analytical kind of like penchant, basically that that kind of like the melancholic individual has and a kind of ability to kind of read into things and it's kind of, it's a gloss on Aristotle, um, and that comes up in Freud's in Freud's theory and I think in some ways Watt is 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 searching in a, in a similar sort of melancholic kind of way but it's so it's so sort of hollow and brittle his his searches and his paradigms but. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> First, I have a comment, which is that each paper, I was trying to think what brings these three papers together, and I think, honestly, it's a bit of a stretch, but it seems to me that each of your papers actually has interesting moments where the question of the assumption of legibility comes up. So if you'd showed me that sculpture of the two men holding hands, without telling me that this is Nazi art. I could easily have thought this is the cover for gay porn, you know, something that was going into a very different direction. So I guess part of what, you know, that raises the whole question of reading homosexuality in relation to all kinds of figurations of Nazi um, ideology and so on. But actually my question is for Catherine. And here it has to do with a very basic question of legibility, which is mm -hmm. what do you do with readers like me who can't read music? I don't think Beckett was particularly into, like, concerned with matters of intelligibility. <laughs> um, it's a good point because you wouldn't have the same relationship with the musical content and I, I imagine that's what's given me this opportunity to be able to come to it and say this is how I think it's working because... Uh, yeah, May I ask yeah. a follow-up question? Yes, go Did on. you ever think of singing it? 
Did, you, did I ever think of singing it as part of your presentation? Um, no, I did think about, um, I did think it would be useful for you to hear it, and we were going to get around to recording it and, and, and didn't. But um, when I was talking about the elongation of the um, fourth and I can't remember which tones it was now. I was talking about some tones that we elongated, which gave the impression that it was um, being recalled from memory. When you hear that, it's much more obvious that it's, it's a kind of labored um, memorization process, um, a, a remembering. Um, and it's, and, and, and it, yeah, it's much more obvious audibly than it is me showing you on the screen. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I didn't do that. I probably should have done. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, thanks so much for each of the um, presentations. My question is for Patrick. So um, I'm curious if in your research, if um, Beckett writes in his diaries about his trip to, um, in 1936-37, about having encountered the work of Otto Dix or George Gross um, at all, if that has come up. And if it hasn't, if maybe you could just speculate a bit as to what you, maybe why he was more drawn to German expressionism as a, um, you know. So it's a question about maybe his avoidance of right. uh, the Dadaists or Otto Dix's representations of uh, war veterans, more so figures that I would think maybe in the encounter would resonate a bit with um, Beckett's interests. So. I don't know if that's clear. <laughs> yeah, well, there's another thing that ties these papers together, the missed uh, encounters, I suppose. Um, I, I, I think he must have encountered that art, though he doesn't comment on it at anywhere near the length that he comments on Barlock or Kirchner or some of the other artists that he was um, interested in. I think part of it is based on the relationships that he had, the people that he encountered during his trip, and, and they kind of guided his interest and, and led him to particular things. And that's the other element of this, the sort of human element. So he wasn't just looking at these works in galleries. He was having conversations with people, sitting down for meals with people, hearing about their experience of being persecuted for their artistic work. So I mean, that's another whole dimension of the journey, which would be part of a longer account of the German diaries, certainly. Um, Dix, not so much. Um, one of the things that strikes me, the, the, the other absent presence in my papers, I've said nothing about how this might apply to an understanding of his literary production, um, which was an assiduous <laughs> uh, effort on my part because uh, I want to read the diaries uh, as a text uh, with their own kind of importance. Um, but I think what's interesting, maybe in regards to what you've asked, and interesting in thinking about how this might connect with his literary production, I quoted briefly Tobin Siebers in my uh, paper, and his uh, formulation of disability aesthetics is grounded in a response to degenerate aesthetics in the, in the work of um, Nazi ideologues in the 30s and 40s, um, so in, in particularly in the representation of the body. So I think the way to, to draw a, a line from or build a bridge from what Beckett is experiencing uh, both in the conversations he had and the art that he encountered would be to think about the way he represents the body uh, thereafter as, as decrepit, as disabled, as compromised in some way. Um, and I think that's probably clear from the images that I showed. I mean, those, those Nazi images, whatever their other connections, are certainly of robust, healthy bodies. And I think there's, you know, there's a strain of that notion of health that is very much present. I mean, I repeated that term several times when I referred to Nordau. That's a key term in degeneration. Um, so you know, Beckett being already familiar with that um, ideology of, of health and sickness from Nordau and seeing how it is borne out in the, uh, the work of the state in Nazi Germany and then carrying forward that experience into his wartime and post-war work would be a, a way of thinking about how the aesthetics he encountered there carried forward into, into his literary production. 
Uh, just a really quick question to, uh, thank you a lot. It was amazing, those papers. Uh, to Doug, I, I was wondering, uh, and I love the, your reading of Villarrutia, if at any moment reading that poem you thought of uh, Marguerite Duras, La Maladie de la Mort. Uh, rem remember uh, the short novel by Duras, uh, I think it's the sickness of death, right? And especially with your definition of death as a non-definable space of pure relation, like if that would be something, especially because Beckett was more like, happy with Duras' uh, work, right? Like, I don't know, for further, maybe, research? Um, yeah, so in terms of, you know, that's, thanks for, you know, for the additional push there, yeah. Um, uh, for me, of course, I was reading this more from Blanchot, which, of course, is more, I think, more uh, theoretically consistent with Beckett's own interest, since he was a, a very large, you know, very big fan of, Beck, of Blanchot and a massive admirer of his work. Um, but, yeah, certainly definitely some place I would like to take it as well, you know, in terms of, yeah, of pursuing this further. Um, uh, but the first, yeah, the first thing I think, you know, if this becomes a larger work, I'd have, I would focus more on literature and the right to death and the, the use of negation in literary language, you know, to, to, to destroy texts and meaning first and therefore create a meaningful discourse in literature and eventually get to a homoerotic body. But first, I need, I need the destruction and the death first. Yeah. Thanks, James.